All right. So uh, if exercise is medicine, which I do believe that it is, it's an important question to address how much medicine do I need to take um, when we're specifically focusing on the health benefits. But what we'll talk about today is addressing of the question, uh, how much strength training do I need to do specifically? How much strength training do I need to do to accrue health benefits, to lose weight? And um, how can I fiddle around with some of the training variables, rep sets, load, um, to make sure that that's optimal? If there is a situation where maybe doing more repetitions or maybe doing strength training more frequently is more optimal for health. Um, so first, let's start with the health benefits of resistance training. Now, before 1990, resistance training was not really a part of the recommendations for exercise from either the American Heart Association or also the American College of Sports Medicine. But aerobics was. So aerobics were recommended for health prior to um, strength training. Um, but early research in the uh, late 80s and then early 1990s showed that the, showed, started showing the health benefits of resistance training. So, for example, in uh, 1989, it was Bevier. Uh, their research group found that back strength was associated with and actually predicted a large portion of the variation in, in bone density. And they also found that it was grip strength, but not aerobic capacity that uh, predicted bone density. This was specifically in, in older women. Then uh, in 1987, so Danny Blessings from Auburn University, they had a group of sedentary middle-aged men perform a variety of free weight and also machine-based exercises for a period of 12 weeks. And what they noticed was that there were significant improvements in their cholesterol profiles. So moving into 1993, Thomas Bowden, he recruited postmenopausal women who were either randomly assigned to a supervised resistance exercise training program or to a control group. And this was done for five months. And their blood serum was analyzed for total cholesterol, uh, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and then also uh, triglycerides. They also measured their body composition and dietary intake. So in this case, their resistance training group showed a decrease in total cholesterol and also a decrease in that LDL cholesterol. And that was significantly different than uh, the control group in this case. And so in 1997, so a, a meta-analysis or a systematic review essentially. So meta-analysis is a statistical analysis of every study in one subject, whereas a systematic review is basically a synthesis of all of the evidence uh, regarding a single topic. So these two types of things, the meta-analysis and the systematic review, uh, are really going to be important for summarizing the health benefits of resistance training. So in 1997, uh, it was a systematic review meta-analysis by George Kelly. Sometimes they can be, they're typically actually together. If you do a meta-analysis, you're also doing a systematic review. But if you do a systematic review, it doesn't necessarily mean you're running uh, statistics on it. But anyways, uh, George Kelly found that resistance exercise uh, re also reduces systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Um, so uh, overall, though, the assessment of muscular strengthening exercises the, within public health surveillance is relatively new, specifically compared to uh, aerobic exercise. And the assessment of the behavior of resistance training is almost entirely reliant, especially with these epidemiological studies on self-report. So people basically saying how frequently do they do strength training? Um, the aerobic assessments or assessments of aerobic exercise tend to be a little bit more objective because people can wear things like accelerometers or Fitbits, um, and that gives pretty good data back. But uh, as of right now, strength training is, is typically reliant on the self-report of the individual. Uh, regardless of this though, this the early evidence basically suggested that muscle strengthening exercise is going to be associated with uh, positive effects on metabolic health. Uh, and this is typically through improved glucose and then also lipid metabolism, and then also uh, improved blood pressure. Uh, in 2012, very important paper by Wayne Westcott. This was a review, Wayne Westcott's out at uh, Quincy College, which is actually near me. Actually, he just retired recently from Quincy College. Um, great guy, but he conducted an excellent and much needed uh, review, which was titled Resistance Training as Medicine. And so through examining the literature, he found that the benefits of resistance training included improved physical performance, 
movement control, walking speed, functional independence, cognitive abilities, and self-esteem. So all, all really important things. Uh, resistance training also may assist in the prevention of and management of two of type two diabetes. Uh, this can be done through reducing visceral fat, uh, reducing HbA1c, increasing the density of glucose transmitter four, so that uh, helps bring blood sugar into the muscles when you're exercising, and also through improved insulin sensitivity. Um, and then he also found that resistance training can increase cardiovascular health. This is through uh, reducing blood pressure, uh, improving cholesterol profiles. Uh, another big thing about strength training is, is that it promotes bone development um, with studies showing a one to 3% increase in bone mineral density. And also resistance training may be effective for reducing uh, low back pain, uh, helping with arthritis and fibromyalgia and Resistance training can also reverse some of uh, basically age-related factors in skeletal muscle. Uh, also, in terms of mental health, uh, 2018 systematic review by Brett Gordon, he found that there was a significant reduction in depressive symptoms for people who engaged in resistance training, and this was uh, irrespective of how frequently they did it or, or their overall intensity of uh, which they engaged in uh, resistance training. So basically just doing it was uh, good for your mental health. A uh, recent paper that we just published showed that on days when individuals do strength training, they actually have a higher positive affect than is typical for them. So if, if my baseline is, is this, if I engage in strength training on that day, my uh, positive affect um, is actually going to be higher on that day that I engaged in strength training. And one of the more recent systematic reviews just Actually, it didn't, uh, it was Rasha al Kabab. hope I said that right, basically conducted a, an overview of every systematic review that looked at the health benefits of resistance training. And this was published in 2020. And they were able to link the benefits of muscle strengthening activities with uh, a reduced risk of mortality. So overall mortality, reduced risk of diabetes a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, and then also some forms of cancer, so colon and kidney cancer. And based on uh, all of these health benefits, public health organizations have set out some guidelines for the participation in resistance training. Again, this lagged behind guidelines for um, aerobic exercise, but the, uh, so the Canadian physical activity guidelines suggest that muscle and bone strengthening activities using major muscle groups should be done on at least two days of the week. The World Health Organization also recommends that. National Health Service recommends the same exact thing. The American College of Sports Medicine says on two to three days uh, per week, adults should perform resistance exercises uh, for each of their major muscle groups. Uh, Australian physical activity guidelines say the same thing. So everyone says do strength training basically at least two times per week. Um, so resistance training Participation, though, is often measured just as that, where people are dichotomized into whether or not they achieve the strength training recommendation. Um, and that doesn't really tell us much about uh, the variation in those different routines. So here's what I mean by that is, let's say that I did strength training four times per week, and each of my routines lasted 60 minutes. I would be lumped into the same exact category as somebody that does uh, strength training two times per week for maybe 30 minutes. So that essentially typically wipes out the variation and doesn't really tell us too much um, about the dose of strength training that uh, people should accumulate in order to achieve health benefits. So the next thing that we'll cover now that we've established the strength, the benefits of engaging in strength training is what is the right dose for which I should engage in strength training to accrue uh, health benefits? Okay, so we have an understanding of the health benefits of engaging in strength training, but strength training has several important variables to consider. One is frequency. So how frequently are you doing strength training? Another is intensity. How heavy are you lifting? Uh, specifically relative to how heavy you can lift. 
how many repetitions you're doing, how many sets you're doing, what's the duration of your strength training routine, and then also what exercises are going into your strength training routine. So an example could be if I, if I was going really heavy with my strength training routine, I would need to do a lower number of repetitions. Um, my strength training routine might be longer depending on uh, what my goal was, but it will be longer probably because I need to rest in between, rest longer in between doing exercises or in between doing uh, sets of the same exact exercise. So it might be valuable to understand how these variables interact uh, to produce differential uh, health benefits. Okay. Um, so Jason Benny, he does a lot of work on strength training epidemiology. So Jason Benny and his colleagues who are out at the University of Southern Queensland in Australia. So what they did was they did a study where they described the association between duration. So how long somebody was doing strength training for and also uh, overall volume. So volume would be reps times sets times load of, of two different strength training modalities. So this is a, one is going to be a gym based strength routine. And then the other one is just using your own body weight. So they examined this and matched it with the prevalence of common chronic health conditions. And this was done with a large uh, population based sample of adults. So what they did is they pooled uh, the two most recent waves of it's called the health survey for England, which included cross sectional data. So what that just really means is I'm measuring how much strength training you're doing. So you ask, answer that question. And then you also answer a question of how many, um, how many chronic conditions do you have or what chronic conditions you have uh, the downside of doing or examining cross sectional data is that you can't really imply causation. Um, but what they did is they had two samples from 2012 and also 2016, um, and they had over 16,000 participants. So having a larger sample size is beneficial, but again, we can't necessarily say that uh, doing strength training in this instance is what uh, causes the lack of a chronic condition or not doing strength training is what causes um, the chronic condition. All we can do is look at, is there an association? And if there is an association between those two things, then you can move into other types of research, such as um, if I get somebody to do strength training, does that um, reduce the odds of them having a chronic condition? Or even if we assessed someone doing strength training, a group of people doing strength training at one time point and see who develops um, a chronic condition. But either way, this was this was a good study. And Jason Benning and his colleagues do a lot of really interesting work. So what they found was for body weight exercises, for gym based exercises, and then so for uh, total, so basically, they took uh, your own body weight exercises, as one category, gym based exercises as one category, and then just combine them together for, for total muscle strengthening uh, duration, they took all of the results and collapsed them into four groups. So people that did um, no strength training, people that did a, a low dose of strength training, so that would be 10 to 20 minutes people that did a moderate dose of strength training. So that's 21 to 59 minutes or those who did a uh, high dose or high duration of strength training, which is going to be uh, greater than or equal to 60 minutes. So people were put into those categories. Um, and so for the volume of self-reported muscle strengthening activities, what they did is they multiplied the frequency by duration. So how many times did they do strength training times the duration and then in, in that duration was days in the last four weeks. So days in the last four weeks of strength training times the typical duration. And then they divided this total volume by four to get the average weekly volume uh, for each respective mode. So that's how that's how volume was calculated. So there's duration and then there's also volume. Um, and so for the volume measure, people were collapsed into none or, or low or high. So three categories for volume. Now, participants were asked to self-report whether a health professional had told them that they had a chronic condition. Okay, so the five chronic conditions that were examined were type 2 diabetes, uh, conditions affecting the heart, respiratory and musculoskeletal systems, and also uh, anxiety or depression. So of all the participants, again, 16, 000, over 16,000 participants, about 10% of them reported having diabetes. 
a heart or respiratory condition and about 20% reported having a musculoskeletal condition or um, anxiety or depression. And over a quarter of the participants reported having at least one chronic condition. And then about 15% reported having at, at least two or, or more. Uh, something about this study is that a, a little bit more than 80% reported doing no body weight strength training exercises, 90% reported doing no gym based uh, strength training exercises. And the typical duration for those that actually did do uh, strength training was about 10 to 20 minutes. And now the key finding from their study was that compared with those doing no or insufficient muscle strengthening exercise, and this was irrespective of mode, volume, or duration, engaging in strength training for at least 10 minutes was associated with a lower likelihood of having a chronic condition. So that's actually quite uh, good news is that it didn't take that much time um, to reduce the odds of being associated with having a chronic condition. So their cross-sectional studies suggest that muscle strengthening exercise at any volume and duration or mode is likely to um, have health benefits. So overall, their findings suggest a lower likelihood for heart, respiratory, or musculoskeletal conditions or multiple chronic conditions among the participants who were doing higher volumes per week of, of muscle strengthening activity. But uh, those with diabetes, anxiety or depression, or having one chronic condition, completing a low uh, volume of weekly muscle strengthening activity was uh, a more favorable associated outcome. So uh, differential doses may have uh, differential effects. Um, other research, so one study by Nunez in 2016, they found that improving total cholesterol, uh, which included LDL cholesterol, and also waist circumference and waist to hip ratios as well as markers of inflammation. So inflammation is going to be associated with a lot of different negative health outcomes. But those people that engaged in higher uh, training volumes, had, which is going to be three sets versus six sets, had um, more beneficial effects than those who did the lower training volume. So that, that's going to be three sets. So that would be for cholesterol profiles. But uh, another study in 2019 found that older adults, regardless of their training frequency, this could be one, two, or three times per week, uh, led to improved HDL cholesterol, which is different than uh, the LDL cholesterol that I had just mentioned. But what this, this same study also found was that resistance training three times per week actually had more of a beneficial effect on reductions in fat mass and then also abdominal fat mass compared to training on fewer times per week. So these are just examples of where it, as long as you do it, you might accumulate health benefits. And then there's some cases where if you do more of it, you'll accumulate uh, more uh, health benefits. So uh, a 2022 study by MoMA and colleagues did suggest also that duration is an important component. So what they found was that the lowest relative risk for uh, mortality CVD mortality and morbidity and also cancer was at 40 minutes per week, 60 minutes per week, and then 30 minutes per week, uh, respectively. So 40 minutes, doing at least 40 minutes per week for mortality, uh, 60 minutes per week for specifically cardiovascular mortal uh, mortality, and then 30 minutes per week for reductions in the odds uh, of cancer. Another thing that was found was by Dankel and colleagues in 2016, was that for each additional 10 minute increase in resistance training activity, there was an associated reduced risk of uh, having diabetes. So that that's an interesting one where, um, and this seems to be the trend is that uh, longer durations have beneficial effects um, on metabolic health. And, and this goes hand in hand with that uh, earlier study that I was referencing where um, doing strength training three times per week was associated with reductions in fat mass and then also um, abdominal fat mass when that's compared to doing it under three times per week. So, uh, so what is the right dose of strength training? Um, this may be better addressed by examining muscle strength. Um, this is because to obtain strength or increase muscle size for that matter, um, the body needs to have stress placed upon it. And that's going to have to be more stress than it's accustomed to. 
So strength is going to be improved by lifting heavier weights. And then also overall increases in training volume do have beneficial effects on muscle size, which is associated with a variety of health benefits. And I think that this is interesting. And this is why um, strength may be also important. So we're talking about strength and then also the just the participation in uh, resistance training, because while participation probably will lead to improved strength, that's not necessarily the case. Um, someone could do strength training and just kind of leisurely go through a routine and not, not push themselves. They probably wouldn't see as much of an improvement in muscular strength as uh, somebody that pushed themselves. But so uh, another study by Dankel found that so stronger people meeting the resistance training guidelines did have the greatest risk reduction for um, all cause mortality. But that risk was no different than strong people not meeting the guidelines. So in this case, it was just being strong was important um, for health promotion. So this points to probably an important fact that even frequent participation in resistance training, it doesn't necessarily guarantee uh, greater levels of muscular strength. It's certainly the one thing that does help with improving muscular strength. But if this is performed at low intensities, it might not have too much of an effect on uh, muscular strength. So the actual quality of your resistance training participation is going to matter. Uh, like I referenced earlier, resistance training does have uh, volume. So that, which is going to sets times reps times load and also duration components. So while the frequency with which somebody engages in, in resistance training is, is certainly going to be important. Um, the other aspects of strength training intensity specifically is, is probably also going to be uh, quite important for um, actually improving muscular strength. Okay. So the next thing that we'll cover is what are the health benefits of being stronger and why is that going to be important for looking at um, what is the dose of strength training that I should engage in uh, to obtain health benefits, or we might even just be able to say to increase my strength. So let's talk about strength and what's that associated with. <clears throat> so first off, having adequate muscle mass is uh, critical for a number of things, including longevity. So living longer, uh, disease prevention, continued physical functioning. And this is particularly true uh, for older adults. It's always beneficial to have reserve strength and build it up when you're younger. Higher levels of, of muscle mass and then also strength are going to be associated with reduced insulin resistance, and then also uh, the prevalence of things like diabetes and, and prediabetes. Um, losing muscle mass is, is associated with detrimental things like sarcopenia, um, increased and also increased system at, system, systemic, ooh, can't talk, systemic inflammation. So one way to really assess strength, an easy way to assess strength is hand grip. So a hand grip test really gives an indication or an approximation of, of whole body muscular strength. Um, so this is important because lower grip strength is associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular disease and mortality, um, worsening activities of daily living. So these are all the things that we need to basically do to live independently. And also it's uh, lower grip strength is associated with a higher risk of developing uh, type two diabetes. So now maybe like, let's talk about, is there a threshold of strength that's important to have to prevent um, certain negative health outcomes or to what extent is being stronger make us healthier? Um, so try not to butcher this name, but it's Sator uh, Kunustor, who is from uh, the Bristol Medical School in the UK, conducted a meta-analysis of 10 population-based studies. And what they found was that an increased hand grip strength was associated with a lower risk of, of type two diabetes and the protective effects of having a higher hand grip strength. What they hypothesized was that, um, these protective effects on vascular disease might be mediated by, so these are the mechanisms through which it's protective through uh, a reduction in weight gain, <clears throat> stronger people don't gain as much weight reductions in abdominal obesity, um, reductions in insulin resistance, and then also reductions 
um, in inflammation. So these might be the things that stronger people have that make sure that they do not have uh, a diabetes. And so there, there was a significant reduction in the odds of having diabetes when they uh, compared the strongest people to the lower uh, quartiles of, of uh, individuals of different levels of strength. So they would have, you know, the weakest, the second weakest, the third, uh, the second strongest, and, and then the strongest. So the strongest group has the highest uh, reduction in risk of having diabetes. So, so more strength in this case is better. Um, so Mark Peterson, next study, he's from the University of Michigan. Uh, what he did was he examined data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. This is the NHANES survey. You might have heard of it. And uh, from one wave of this survey, the 2011 to 2012 wave, they had a slightly over 4,000 participants who completed uh, a valid hand grip dynamometer test. So they tested their hand grip. Uh, they also had blood samples. So for, from there, they obtained non-fasting uh, glycohemoglobin. Um, and they also had a valid questionnaire pertaining to um, basically how much physical activity did they do and also how sedentary they, how sedentary they were. Um, so in both men and women, uh, grip strength, so the stronger you are, this was inversely correlated with HbA1c levels. Um, so if I'm stronger, my HbA1c is lower, as is my fasting glucose, two-hour glucose. Um, so basically all of these measures for... Um, diabetes were improved if individuals um, were stronger. They also had um, reduced insulin resistance. So what they found was that lower grip strength was strongly associated with diabetes. And this is interesting. Um, this was such that for every 0 0.05 reduction in normalized strength, there was a 1.26 increased odds, um, even when adjusting for other factors known to cause diabetes of that person having diabetes. So Mark Peters in another study that he worked on, um, this was looking at, at cancer uh, mortality. They looked at 11 prospective studies. This was actually with over a million participants. And what they found was, so for cancer, actually overall greater hand grip strength, um, and then also leg extension strength was not necessarily associated with, with cancer mortality. So this would be one of the cases where um, muscular strength is associated with, with one outcome quite strongly, but perhaps um, another outcome not uh, to not as great of an extent. Uh, another study by Dr. Antonio Garcia Hermoso well, examined 38 studies, which included almost 2 million participants. And what they found was that adults with higher muscular strength levels, which again was measured by uh, hand grip strength, had a 31% reduced uh, all-cause mortality risk compared to those adults with the lowest muscular strength. Uh, this was also found for knee extension strength. So this is the adults with higher knee extension strength. They had uh, lower levels uh, or a lower risk, actually a 14% lower risk, uh, reduced risk of death from all cause. Um, so I, I guess uh, this is a good thing to know is that stronger people uh, end up living longer. Uh, it might not necessarily be the case that it's cancer mortality that that causes that. Although um, I did mention earlier that there are some types of cancer that strength training participation can uh, prevent. But in this case, it just seems like being stronger really prevents all cause mortality. Um, in an, in a more recent 2021 systematic review is by uh, Meng Zhao Ku, who's from the Department of Endocrinology and Metabolism, which is at the uh, first hospital of Jilin University, and that's in China. And they looked at 15 studies, which had almost 28,000 participants. So what they found was that poor grip strength was associated with a higher risk of cognitive decline, which is also an important thing that I think people would like to avoid. Um, so basically that they also found was that people with uh, worse grip strength had a higher relative risk of also suffering uh, from dementia. So there's these different aspects where muscular strength is important, um, brain health, all-cause mortality, uh, diabetes risk reduction. So what we'll do is we'll move on now to specifically looking at, at weight loss. We'll talk about... Um, still just general participation in resistance training, but we'll get a little bit more granular and continue to look at 
uh, the interaction between rep sets, load and duration, and how does that potentially have, have an impact on, on weight loss, um, exercise in general, resistance training is going to be really, really great for maintaining weight loss. Um, it does of course supplement, uh, caloric restriction when you are trying to lose weight. Resistance training is really beneficial when you're trying to lose weight because you will maintain the muscle that you have. So when you're, when you're losing weight, we want to make sure that it's not, um, not too much of it is coming from a reduction in muscle. So, uh, what we'll do is next is we'll go into, uh, resistance training, how you can put together your routine, um, that works well for weight loss. All right. So because you made it this far, you get a chance to uh, meet my dog scout. He'll hang out with me until he doesn't feel like hanging out with me anymore. Who knows? But th so now we'll cover resistance training and its association with fat loss. And then specifically, how should we do strength training in terms of what are the reps, sets, load, uh, rest periods that might be the best for uh, losing weight? Oh, you're really staying here for a long time. All right, you can go back over there. We'll bring you over. So, all right, so resistance training is going to be associated with a reduction in, in body fat. Um, again, exercise does help with weight loss. It's really going to be more of that caloric restriction, but uh, resistance training is important because it contributes to uh, preventing the loss of lean body mass when in a caloric deficit. Um, also, hypertrophic gains, so gains in muscle size increase your resting metabolic rate. Okay. So if you gain muscle, you end up uh, burning more calories at rest. Now there's a lot of different, so many, many different varieties uh, or methods used for resistance training that really involve the manipulation of, of the following training variables. It's going to be intensity. So how heavy you lift your rest periods, and then also total training volume, which again, is going to be composed of rep sets and load. I guess three of the most commonly used ways to do strength training include circuit training, um, hypertrophy training, again, that's training to put on muscle size, and then more strength training, uh, or, or I guess kind of like a powerlifting style of training where we're lifting heavy and resting for longer periods of time. So circuit training involves lighter loads. That's about 40 to 60% of your maximum. Um, when you're training for hypertrophy, this, this type of training occurs at higher intensities than circuit training. Um, because the intensity or the weight that you're lifting is higher, maybe like 70 to 80%, although hypertrophy can occur at any training intensity. But if you're training at a higher intensity, 70%, you're going to need longer rest periods. And then strength training use, utilizes the highest training intensity, the heaviest weight which means you're going to have prolonged rest periods. So it's going to be beneficial to know which um, exercise modality, circuit training, hypertrophy training, or strength training is going to be the best uh, for changes in body composition. And then we'll focus again specifically on, on reduced body fat. So oxygen consumption, which is going to be reflective of caloric expenditure in strength training is a function of the distance that the load moves and then also uh, the load. Okay. So if I was doing a deadlift, picking something off the, up off the floor, how far am I moving the barbell? And then also how much weight is on the barbell. So the distance, the bar travels or dumbbells or whatever you're using. And also the load that you're using has an influence on caloric expenditure. Uh, heavier loads means more in increased oxygen consumption. Like if you've ever done a moderate weight squat for high repetitions, you're probably breathing quite heavily uh, and you're probably actually uh, burning a decent amount of calories too. So these resistance training routines differ on the following variables on rest periods, intensity, and total training volume. So all of these variables do share a relationship. When training at a high intensity, so a really, really heavy weight, the rest periods need to increase and then therefore training volume per unit of time will decrease. Um, so for example, if we equated volume, it would take us um, longer to finish a strength training routine than it would um, to more of like a bodybuilding or hypertrophy routine. So for example, Brad Schoenfeld, who, who's done a lot of work in muscle growth, this is back in, in 2014, found that it took 
17 minutes to complete a more bodybuilding or hypertrophy routine compared to the 70 minutes that it took to do a powerlifting routine that had um, the exact same volume. Again, volume is reps times sets times load. And also when training volume increases, if intensity is held constant, the amount of time that you will need to dedicate to training will, will increase, okay? So we can kind of think of intensity as dictating all other training variables. If I'm going really, really heavy, I need to rest longer, and then I would need to train longer to get an identical um, overall training volume. Um, so therefore, we can think of intensity as also influencing caloric expenditure during exercise. If I'm lifting heavier per repetition, I'm going to be burning more calories. So it's going to be useful to know if uh, per a specific unit of time, one form of resistance training will contribute to a greater caloric expenditure um, during that exercise period. And then also potentially after that exercise uh, period. So, so in terms of intensity, caloric expenditure will increase as intensity increases. Again, this is, think of it as per unit of, of a repetition. So higher intensities produce higher energy expenditure, but it's per unit of actual work time. Okay, so again, you need to think about if I'm lifting really heavy, I need to rest for a longer period of time. So again, the caveat is that as intensity increases, the amount of repetitions and thus total training volume decreases and the amount of rest in between sets also increases. So higher training intensity means less reps and also more rest. So rest interval lengths are going to be dependent on, on your training intensity. They'll also depend on the experience of the trainee and the goal of the training program. Um, so for example, individuals that are come, uh, doing circuit training, they're going to have low rest periods. They go from one exercise to the rest with to the next with minimal rest in between. So it might be three exercises in a row, no rest between those exercises. And then maybe once those three exercises are, are completed, you'll have a brief period of rest. And so if you have a hypertrophy goal, you'll tend to rest longer than if you were uh, doing a circuit routine, but probably less, and actually not probably, definitely less than um, if you're doing a powerlifting uh, training routine. So if I'm doing a hypertrophy routine, I might do a bench press for 10 to 12 repetitions, rest 90 seconds, and, and then do it again. Or maybe I'm pairing that with something like a row and then still resting 90 seconds. So Training with higher volumes is going to, it will actually mathematically and then also logically contribute to uh, greater caloric expenditure, but it's not that the, this relationship is going to always be perfectly linear. Um, so for example, if I, a three times greater training volume does not mean that the person will expend three times the amount of calories. Okay. Um, so training with lower intensities. Uh, and therefore higher repetition will of course yield a considerably higher training volume. Um, so for example, Nicholas Radames, who's done a lot of strength training research, used a 10 repetition protocol. Um, it was 10% lower than, and one was 10% lower intensity than a five repetition protocol, but 43% um, higher in overall, overall volume. So uh, the 10 repetition protocol was 43% higher than, than a protocol that was 10% uh, lower intensity, but used um, five repetitions. So it's gonna be of practical relevance to really examine if there's an optimal style, resistance training style for a caloric expenditure. So this optimal training style would have uh, high training density, which is going to be measured by total volume of work per unit of time. And when we're thinking about this, all of the training variables, the intensity, repetitions, rest, that all needs to be considered. So the, a really, really heavy, a heavy strength training routine, which means lower repetitions, are not going to be economical for, for volume accumulation. This is specifically due to the low number of rep, repetitions completed, and then also longer rest periods. Um, hypertrophy, so muscle growth oriented training protocols where we're using eight to 12 reps, provide more volume per training second than strength training routines. So you'll get more volume in. Again, that was demonstrated by that Schoenfeld study where it took 70 minutes to get a certain amount of volume with a hypertrophy based routine and then 17 
uh, I'm sorry, it took 70 minutes with the strength training routine to get the same amount of volume as uh, the 17 minutes for a hypertrophy oriented routine. So the, if we're going for hypertrophy, eight to 12 reps, 70% of our max, that's going to, you're going to accumulate more volume than you would with a heavy strength training routine. Okay. At some point, it's not going to necessarily be beneficial in terms of volume accumulation to, to continually go lower, lower in intensity. Um, so for example, it, it's probably not that, that economical to be doing something for 40 reps at like a 30 or 40% one repetition max, rather probably something around the 60% of your max range where you're able to do something, maybe like 12 to 20 repetitions is probably going to be the most beneficial for volume accumulation. So if you're doing circuit training, let's say three exercises, training various muscle groups. So maybe you did a dumbbell press, a dumbbell row, and then a goblet squat for 12 to 20 repetitions. Each rest period would be greatly reduced. So I don't necessarily have to rest that much because I'm training different muscle groups. So rest periods low and my training volume is going to be high. So in terms, in terms of a routine, you probably want to go with something that's more circuit based. Okay. So, um, a circuit based routine where we're training different muscle groups where you don't necessarily need to rest as long between sets. Um, this all being said, there is certainly value to training in hypertrophy based. So muscle growth based intensities where, you, where maybe you're not having as much volume as um, that, that circuit that I just mentioned. And there's also value to getting stronger. If you can get stronger, you'll be able to do more overall work. So for example, a really strong person can do more work, even if we went back to that circuit routine, therefore they will be able to burn more calories. And again, if you, if you can put on some muscle, that's gonna have a significant impact on your resting metabolic rate. Um, so this might be a little bit of a roundabout way to saying that uh, perhaps in the moment for maximum caloric expenditure, circuit-based training, again, that's you know a higher frequency, I'm training more, I'm training at, at uh, low to moderate intensities for moderate to high repetitions, that might be best for in the moment caloric expenditure. But if we can do routines where um, we're building muscle, again, you can actually build muscle at all different training intensities, but let's say 70% of your one rep max for eight to 12 repetitions, that's going to be beneficial, um, putting down muscle, improving your uh, resting metabolic rate. And then if you can also get stronger too, so maybe you're doing some work, uh, in, in a heavy, uh, heavy intensity, that's probably going to be beneficial as well, because in the long run, that will increase your overall capacity, um, to have higher training volumes. Okay, so I brought Scout back just to say that, okay, so if you want a cheat sheet for all this, I'll have a PDF associated with this where we can talk about, um, where are you going? Where we can talk about where does, um, basically where does frequency, duration, intensity, where does it matter in terms of health benefits? Um, are there types uh, or health outcomes where just doing it matters? So for example, if just the act of doing resistance training is beneficial for uh, reduction of depressive symptoms, whereas um, we, we discussed how every 10 minute increase in resistance training participation reduces the odds uh, of having diabetes. So there's going to be cases where it's uh, just do it, this is beneficial. And there's also going to be cases where uh, we're basically doing it at specific frequencies or, or durations um, is going to be beneficial. And that seems to be particularly true for things uh, that involve metabolic health. Um, and then also just the fact that being stronger for the most part does have a positive effect on your health. So that lends itself to at, at least incorporating higher training intensities. And then also it would seem that if you're looking to burn the a high amount of calories, circuit based training might be some of the more beneficial types of strength training. And this is not to say don't do uh, training that focuses on muscle growth or training that focuses on improving your strength because that will eventually have uh, crossover and also quite tremendous benefits um, on your health as well.